back, everybody. Wednesday, hump day. So, one of the things we've been doing, sort of as we continue our discussion of, you know, uh, basics of computer programming is expanding our ability to work with data. So last week, we looked at arrays. It's a way of organizing data into a sequence of values. Um, and that's an appropriate way of organizing a variety of different kinds of data in the world, right? We talked about music, we talked about text. So today we're gonna introduce Java's support for working with a particularly special kind of data in our computer programs, text, strings. And the reason why this is so special is that, you know, if you think about all the data in, in the world, right? The, data that's all around us, the data that people are using to change the world. And, you know, there's, you can sort of break it down, I would argue, into two categories. There's the data about the universe, right? And that data is almost entirely, in fact, I would argue it's uniformly numerical. Everything about the world we've managed to measure is, is numbers. And Java's great at working with that kind of information. That's why we have all these different numeric data types that are built into the language as part of the set of primitive types. But there's also this thing, this data that we've created as humans, right? You know, if, if an alien race lands on the pla our planet, the thing that will be unfamiliar to them, although they'll probably have something like it in their own culture, is text, right? They'll, they'll have figured, I mean, if they find their way here, they'll have figured out all the numeric stuff, right? We'll have that in common. But the text, the language, right? Is that a characteristic of civilization? Probably. Right? So again, they'll probably have some equivalent. And if we look at you know, uh, some of the more intelligent types of animals, we find that they have various ways of communicating with each other. But text, the ability to write down our thoughts and things about the world is something that really distinguishes us as a species. And text also gets a little bit of special treatment in Java as well. So one of the reasons we talk about spring, uh, springs, strings now, or text, or how we work with text in Java, is that strings are also kind of a transitional point where we start moving away from talking about working with basic data in Java, and we work towards looking at Java support for something called objects. Right? Now that's something that's gonna consume us for the middle third of the class. Okay, so any questions about functions from last time before we go off and, and explore strings? I have a couple more examples at the end that I sort of borrowed from, uh, from Friday's class. So. Um, Monday's class, so if we, if we have some time, we'll get there. All right, so, so again, you know, we, we've talked about how to store data using Java's eight primitive types. Uh, we know how to store integer values, values that don't have a decimal point. We know how to store floating point numbers. Um, we know how to store characters, and we know how to store Boolean values. And we've also looked at ways to store sequences of these. And these are great for representing lots of data, but as I was just saying, there's a big hole in this picture, right? And you might think, well, technically, you know, I can represent something like this. I don't know if anybody recognizes this book. This is a book called Infinite Jest, written by David Foster Wallace, who grew up in this area, actually, a famous uh, American writer. Um, it's a long book, uh, but, you know, this is textual data. Again, this is characteristic of our species and our civilization, what it means to be human. We write down our thoughts. We we encode them in a way that others can then, you know, across time and space. So David Foster Wallace isn't alive anymore, but he wrote down this, you know, a secret of his thoughts, you know, into a story spanning almost a thousand pages. And now you can pick that up and you can have some sense of what it was like to think like. Right? That's pretty special. You guys use text to communicate about all sorts of things, right? Whether those are sort of mundane, but also very deep, you know, powerful things. So. And we think about the impact that something like Facebook is having on the world, whether that's good or bad, right? You know, largely one of the ways that Facebook is having an impact is by moving text around, by putting text in front of people's eyeballs, right? Um, that might change your views about a particular person, it might change your views about a particular politician or a particular issue, right? Or it might, you know, be the beginning of a romantic relationship that might end up really uh, changing your life. Right? Um, and of course, you know, we use text throughout the world to identify things in ways that are also mundane, but potentially interesting from the perspective of a computer scientist. So license plates, right? License plates have text on them. Why, why is this interesting from the perspective of data, right? Anybody noticed anything recently new about the world? Um, you know, 
from a that might make you a little concerned about what's written on your license plate or the availability of this information? You guys aren't hearing on yet, yeah. What's that? Yeah, so license plates will uniquely identify the vehicle. So every vehicle, you know, every plate issued in the state of Illinois, for example, will have a unique connection, uh, collection of letters, and it's, that plate is associated with a person, right? So in order to get a plate, you have to go to the DMV and give them some information. And so they have uh, a database, right, where they have computer data sitting somewhere that allows them to, if they see a particular plate, look up who the owner of that vehicle is. Why is this, you know, why is this potentially uh, worrisome? What has started to happen um, in the world around it? Yeah. Well, I think, so the question is, are we running out of plates? I think we have plenty of plates. Like, if you look at some of the states, like California, they just keep adding letters, right? So we're, we're fine, right? Come on. You guys, some of you know the answer to this question, right? You, know, you, you guys ever seen a police car before? How many people have seen a police car? Do you notice it's got cameras on it? All four sides, some of them. What do you think those cameras are doing? As it drives around, yeah. They're reading plate numbers, yeah. So I, at this point, given all the advances in machine learning and other things, I could put a camera on my car if I wanted to that as I'm driving around town is just taking the feed of the video from around me and it's scanning for things that look like license plates, and when it sees one, it can actually read the numbers off that plate. Now, for me, that might be interesting just from a personal perspective, but if you have access to the database that actually allows you to look up who owns the vehicle, then you start to have some sense of where a particular person was at a particular time. Right? So, so things happen. And again, this is another way that text data gets used or potentially misused. And then, of course, we ask you to provide text to do things like authenticate, right? So a lot of the world, the data, the interesting data in the world around us is in this textual form, right? And there's a lot of things that are interesting about text data. I won't get into all of them here, right? Uh, textual data is also a lot less structured than other forms of data, right? Human language has all sorts of weird inconsistencies, and so training computers to understand that has taken us a long time. We're still working on this problem, right? So as a computer scientist, you, starting today, you will call a text a string. Um, I don't know if people use that term if they're not computer scientists, but I've been doing this for too long and can't remember how to not use it, right? So we call text strings. Um, a string is a unit of text. It, considers, it you know, consists of a sequence of characters, um, okay? In Java, one of the things that's interesting is we have a special, again, textual data is so important that in Java we have a special type for working with this data, and the type is called string, and it's capitalized. And that's interesting and important and significant. We will come back to why this is the case in a minute, okay? Now, in many ways, this is confusing, okay? Java as a language tends to be consistent to a fault, and it's actually consistent in many ways that, find, that, that end up making it irritating. But this is one place where it's a little bit inconsistent. So um, you can work with data that's a string as if it's a literal, uh, sorry, as if it's a primitive type. So I can assign a string to a value. This is a string literal over here on the right side of line two. A character literal we enclose in single quotes, a string literal we enclose in double quotes. That's, those are the rules. So that's the only, I think they're actually, they're changing this now in a new version of Java, for, but for now this is what we're going to do, okay? So this is a string. It consists on some level as you might notice, this consists of a sequence of characters, and so we could, we could store this as an array of characters, and in fact, that's how strings in Java actually store this data internally. Remember, every piece of data that we work with in Java has to be represented in some way as a combination of those eight primitive types. So what I've done here is I've created an array of seven characters, and that stores uh, my last name, right? And then here, I've created an array of five characters, right? But I can work with string data in Java as if it um, just like the data that I've already been working with, okay? But there's something new happening here, and it doesn't take long for us to notice, because strings have this 
can do things. Strings have these features that we can access, okay? So, so here's an example, right? And, and again, I mean, you can substitute int here and you can just say int literal and it kind of looks similar to what we've been doing until you get to line two where I see something weird. So now I've got a variable called password. Um, it's of type string and I've initialized it with this string literal, the name of my dog. Not choo choo dog, just choo choo. Um, but now, and I'm gonna run this code and I'm gonna show you what it does, there's something new happening here, right? So what's on line two, I've got the name of my variable password, I've got a dot, and then I'm doing something that almost looks like it's a method or a function call. I'm using the word length and then I've got empty parentheses. Down on line three, this is even a little bit stranger, right? I've got the name of my variable, dot, and then again, this looks like a method call, and I'm actually passing an argument now. I'm passing the string, a string literal to equals, and that prints false, okay? So strings, the, the, why this is the case is that strings in Java are not primitive types. Remember we said there are eight primitive types. Every primitive type stores a single value. In Java, strings are actually our first example of what's called an object, All right? And we will talk about objects a lot. Strings are kind of our on-ramp. They're our gentle introduction to objects um, because you can actually in initialize them with literals. With most objects, that's not the case. Objects in Java and in other programming languages combine state with behavior. So on some level, they act both like a variable but that variable also carries around certain methods or functions with it wherever it goes. So once I have a string, let's go back here, once I have a string variable, I have some methods that I can call on that variable using what's called dot notation. So one of them is called length. What do you think that method does? Just based on our example here. It, it returns the length of that string. So if I change the string to be something else, you'll see that, again, I see the length of the string is three. It's a count of the number of characters, right? Um, strings also have an equals method. That equals method allows you to compare two strings together to see if their contents are the same. So what do I need to do to make this equal? So right now, equals returns false, but if I compare two strings that have the same sequence of characters, then equals returns true, okay? Now again, I, I understand this is sort of you know disorienting when you see it for the first time. So whenever we talk about objects in Java, and we're gonna talk a lot about objects in Java, that's a major focus of this class going forward, but whenever we talk about objects, we think about two things. The first one is, what data does it store? What's its state? And in this case, the state of a string is the sequence of characters that I use to initialize it. That's the data that is stored in the string. And then what can it do? What sort of behaviors or methods does it support? And here, I'm gonna show you in a minute, there's a whole bunch. Java strings come with a bunch of really interesting features and methods that I can use to work with them that are you know, useful for working with textual data. So again, it's frequently very useful to know how long a string is. And so if I wanna find that out, let's say I wanna loop and I wanna look at every character in the string. Well, now I can use string.length to figure out how long the string is. Let's say I have two strings and I want to check if they're equal. Let's say you entered a password into my website and I need to check to see if you entered the right password. I can use string.equals and I can pair it with some other string. Right, so these are useful methods that come along with a string that Java has built in. They're there waiting for you to use. You don't have to write them. Um, they're already provided, right? And again, I'll show you in a minute a list of all these different uh, and again, these are the two things that we think about whenever we look at an object in Java. What does it store? What does it do? So again, how does it behave like a variable? What information can I store? And then what methods does it bring along with it? What are the different things that I can do once I have them? Right. So when we compare objects and primitives, so the primitive types in Java, remember, store a single value. And those primitive types all have lowercase names. Primitive types also in Java don't have any methods that come along with them, right? There's no way to, uh, if I have an int, I can't call variable dot whatever. There's no way to use dot notation on primitive type. You can try, and we'll see if it's going to work, right? Um, in, in contrast, an object can be a mixture of any different types I want, right? 
Um, and the convention in Java is that objects always, the type of an object always starts with an upper case letter. It's called a class, and again, we, we will spend a fair amount of time in the middle of the semester writing our own class definitions because this is one of the ways that you model data in Java. You want to represent real world data, you start building your own classes to represent that data in ways that we will talk about in a few weeks, right? But this is one of the ways that we can identify a string as an object is that its name starts with an uppercase letter, right? That's our clue, right? And again, we're going to give you lots of practice at using and designing your own object and you'll see how to, uh, how you can create your own type of object. You can actually create types in Java. You're not limited to the ones that are built in. You can create your own and you can use them to model data in ways that you think is useful, right? Now, here's one of the things that's different about a string. Normally, when we create an object in Java, we have to use this new keyword. Then we'll remember where we saw new before. Yeah, array. Arrays in Java are actually objects. That's why they have a dot length uh, field. Do you remember that? So normally when I create an object in Java, I have, this is, this is the syntax that I use. And again, we'll come back and talk about this later when we talk about object constructors and how they work. So normally I say, now this on the left side looks a lot like our normal variable declaration. I have the type, string, a name, my string, but the assignment part looks quite different. I have this new keyword, and then I have something that looks a little bit like a, a method call. I have a name, I have open close parentheses, and then I have some information in there. In this case, it's the contents of the string. You can create strings this way in Java. It will work. But this is, again, this place where Java is just sort of strangely inconsistent because, well, may, or maybe it's friendly. It's trying to be helpful. So rather than forcing you to do this every time you need to create a string, strings are common enough that strings are one of only two objects in Java. And I actually know what both of them are. Um, because I'm into Java trivia. Um, but strings are one of two, uh, the other one you'll never use, where you can initialize them with a literal. So this is the only object in Java that I don't have to call new if I want to create one, right? Instead, on the right side of the assignment, I just use the string literal, which is open uh, double uh, quotes, series of characters, close double quotes. That's how I create a string, okay? And I can use this anywhere uh, I want to create a string, right? Now again, in practice, there are tiny, tiny little sort of stupid differences between these two, but we're not gonna worry about them. Instead, we're just gonna use this syntax when we work with strings, because Java provides it for us, because it's nice. So, you know, again, it's the one of the only ones that su supports literals, and so it fits in here. So here was the way that we created a variable type int called first, we initialize it with a literal. Here's a uh, variable, is hot, true, uh, character literal, and then down here a string literal. These are all primitive types, the top three, lowercase name. This is our first object type, uppercase name, but it's one of the only objects you can initialize in this way, using an assignment call. All right. And again, as we pointed out just a minute ago, arrays are our other example of an object, right? When we initialize an array, we use this new keyword, um, and then we provide it. And, and again, the syntax here is a little weirder uh, that we might like, but uh, arrays are also objects. That's why they have this dot length. No. All right, questions at this point? Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so that's a great point, right? So this is another place where Java is kind of weirdly inconsistent. So if you have an array and you want to know the length, you do dot length. It's a property of that array. If you have a string and you want to know the length, you do dot length, and then you actually need to call it as a method with no argument. So there's an open and close parentheses. Why is this the case? I don't know. Um, I wish, sometimes I wish I knew the people that made these decisions so I could send them an email and be like, why? Right? Um, but we, we live with it as we're using it. Yeah, that's So strings also support uh, concatenation in a way that's pretty natural and allows us to create you know, uh, formatted strings in some nice ways, right? So for example, here is um, this little code snippet. Um, good question. This little code snippet, I'm creating a string uh, variable called first on line one, initializing it to the literal Jeffrey. I'm creating the string last on line two, initializing it to the literal challenge, and then I'm combining the two together 
um, and I'm saving the result as a new variable, okay? So remember, let's think about how our assignment works in Java. Whenever I do an assignment, I start on the right side and I evaluate this expression. So I've got a variable first, Java looks up the value of that variable, which is challenge. Then I'm adding an empty space, so just one blank space. That's a literal, a uh, string literal. And then I'm adding last. And when I do add, again, this is concatenation. So I add the string onto the end of the current string. So when I'm done, this whole uh, fold will receive the value Jeffrey space check. All right, so let's play with these a little bit uh, in our in our playground, just to get a sense of how this works. Um, so I'll look at what the combined string is here. So again, this is concatenation. Um, I can, you know, when I'm, this is particularly useful when you're using uh, println. If you guys are using this for your debugging, you can print things. I can pass essentially a, um, a concatenation of two strings to println so I can see what's going on. This is something that I'll do sometimes in my programs when I'm trying to figure out why it's not working properly. Just displaying the value of a variable can be a useful debugging strategy to find out why at this point in the code is the variable different than what I expected. Um, and again, I don't have to, you know, use this new syntax and I probably wouldn't probably just use, use the literal syntax and this will work fine. All right, good. So this is our, also our first place where we're going to look at something called dot notation. And this will get natural to you, right? So to access a particular object's state and methods, we use a special notation called dot notation. So whenever we have an object variable, and if we want to call one of the methods that object provides, we use the name of the variable, dot, and then the name of the method. And these are methods. It's like calling a function. If the method takes arguments, you have to replace, you have to provide the arguments that you want it to use, right? So you'll see here, I've got two methods that don't take arguments. The first one is line two. We've already talked about what length does. The second one is on line four. What do you think that, uh, that, that piece of code does? You want to take a wild guess? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it returns a string that's example with all the characters uppercase. Now, what's a little strange about this? Anybody not from, you know, from a country that doesn't use a Latin alphabet? Yeah. Yeah, so not every language has a notion of case, right? So like, what is, I mean, if, if people in here that, you know, speak Chinese, does Chinese have uppercase characters? I don't know, I don't speak Chinese, but, but this is a, a, a notion that's, you know, somehow tied. And again, you know, unfortunately, when you look at how some of these programming languages evolved, you can see their origins, right? You can see where the people that were developing this language came from. They added a method like this because it was useful to people that use sort of, you know, Latin alphabets. And then now, essentially, if you call this on a string that contains, like, the same thing now with Unicode, right? What if your string contains emojis, right? What's like the uppercase smiling emoji? Right? Maybe it's like a really smiling emoji or something like that. I don't know. Right? Probably not. Probably doesn't make sense. Now let's look at the method on line three. So what do we think this does? And we'll run these pieces of code just to find out, right? But you know, this is something that's useful, particularly when you guys are reading code, um, get a sense of what's happening, just using your intuition. Okay? So I've got a string, and I'm calling this method replace, and then I pa I'm passing one two characters to that method. One is the first argument, one is the second argument. I might guess that this method would do what to the string that's passed? Any guesses? Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna replace the first character with the second character. That's a typical convention when we have methods like this. Basically take the string, find all instances of T, and replace them with the B. Right? Um, all right, so let's, oh, here we go. Let's play with these. We'll come, we'll come back and look at some other ones in there, right? Um, and, and so, you know, these act in the way that we would expect, right? I get the length four, uh, I get a string that is uh, replaced Q with B. One thing I want to point out here about strings is 
important to understand because this, this might be different. I don't remember how Python works. I, don't, I think Python is pretty simple. So none of these methods modify the original string. Okay? So you'll see here, even after I call example.replace, example contains the same characters that I initialized it with on line one. Whenever I work with strings in Java, when I, once I initialize the string, that string never changes. Any method that I call on it that might seem to modify it will actually return a new string. So it creates a new string and returns it. So, for example, I can do something like this. I could say, let's create another string and set it to that. Okay, now print example and another string back to that. Okay, so now you can see, I took example, I replaced all the T's with B's, I saved that into this new string variable I created on line three, now I'm printing both of them side by side. So you can see the original string, which is unchanged, and the modified version. All right? So like I said, you know, strings come with all of these really useful methods. And so if you go online, and you can find this pretty easily, um, Job, the Java string class, and there's a lot about this that you're not gonna understand yet, I get that, right? I wish there was like simpler versions of this documentation for people that were just getting started. Um, but there's still a fair amount of useful information in here that you could probably understand. Um, there's some examples about how to use strings at the top, and then at some point we get into, um, this is all the ways you can create strings. Now we get into all the different methods that we can call on string objects. Right? And so, and so here's how, if you haven't read Javadoc before, here's how this works. So the method name is in the middle. And then it's arguments, right? So this says caret, I have to pass an int. Now it gives me the name of that uh, value, which is index, but it doesn't really matter, but it's a hint at how it's used. It returns a character, and then there's a description. So it says returns the character value at the specified index. So let's, let's try this, right? Let's try this first one, carat. This one turns out to be actually kind of useful, right? So let's try this. Let's try system.out.println, example.carat, okay? All right, so the first problem here is that I'm gonna, the job is gonna complain because I can't not pass an argument. I have to tell it which character I want, right? This is gonna pull a character out of the string for me. So let's try carat zero. Now I see T. Let's try caret two. Now I see S. So this is retrieving, essentially this is like an array index. It's basically pulling out the character at that position in the string, where again, we number from zero. We start at zero on the left, move to the right. So this is the third character in the string, which is TES. Right. What do you think is gonna happen if I do something like this? Now I have a I have a string index out of bounds exception. So it's sort of like my array index out of bounds exception, um, except it's for string. Right? So this is telling me five is not a valid index for the string because it only has four letters. Okay. Good. So let's let's look at let's see. Let's let's look at a different one. Oh, okay. Well, how about th this one looks interesting. Ends with. So now I'm gonna try ends with. And what do I need to pass to ends with? So ends with is now at the top. You'll see that it takes another string. And what it does is test if this string ends with this, this specified suffix. So this is going to return a Boolean, either true or false, depending on whether or not the string that I pass ends with, you know, let's try st, right? And now I see true. How might this be useful? Well, imagine I have something like this, you know, and I want to test whether or not this is a valid Illinois email address. I could do something like that. Right? So if you don't give me a valid email address, then it returns false. Right? Well, this will ensure that at least the email address has ends with the specified one. Now you have to do other things to test whether or not it's a real email address because, you know, you could write something dorky like this, um, right? That's not, that's not a valid email address, but whatever. But this could be part of a string processing, and this is also not a valid email address, right? But this could be part of the process of figuring out whether or not an email address you've entered into like a form or 
um, the email address you put in email.txt, for example, is valid. All right. And so I'm not going to go through all of these, but as you work on some of the string-related homework, there are a few there are a few things in here that you do need to know. I know there's a lot of functions here. Uh, feel free to ask on the forum, and you know I think some of the CAs would be happy to point out like the three or four string functions that they find really useful. Um, but on any string, I have access to all of this functionality, right? So, and and that this is this is one of the power of Java objects, right? Is that with the object with this variable comes all of this functionality that's sort of built in, right, waiting for me to use. All right, and we, we just basically did All right, any questions about this? Happily, we have a good chunk of time to do a couple of examples. Yeah. Ah, so the question is, can I, yeah, yeah. So can I string, can I string these operations together, right? So let's say I have a string, and let's say I want to, let's say I want to uh, let me make a little bit of a longer string, right? So let's say I want to take that string, I'm gonna do my string, um, create a new string variable, I'm gonna say my string dot replace the E dot to upper case. And then let's print that. Yeah, yeah, you can. So the question is, can you chain these operators together? You can, as long as they return a string, right? If they don't return a string, then I'm in trouble. So I can't do something like this, right? And, and this is not something that you guys are gonna need to know how to do. I'm just, I'm, I'm entertaining the question. So if I call dot length, what happens is I get an int, and then I try to call two uppercase on it, and it's, the int doesn't have a two uppercase on it. So this doesn't work. But as long as I'm calling string methods that return a new string, I can change it. Yeah. Other questions about strings? Yeah, please take this time in, in class to ask questions. That's why we have it. Um, there are no dumb questions. There are just people that are afraid to ask questions that are probably on the minds of many, many people. Especially if you're new to this. I know strings in Java are weird. Sorry. Now Java is. If you've worked with Python, you might be familiar with this. But those of you that are totally new haven't seen this before. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this is great. So let's say I have um, let's say I have something like test and I just want to replace the first T. Alright, let's let's see if I can do this. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to my documentation, and I'm going to look down here, and ah, look at that. I find a method called replace first, and let's see if that method does what I hope it does. So we're going to print out the result of calling my string dot replace first p b and nice. So, you know, and, and, and this is, you know, again, I know it's really fast, right? I mean, I've, I've done this for too long, and I should, I should, you know, be more conscious about slowing down when someone asks a question like that. I apologize. But that's the, sometimes that's a process you want to go through. If you have something you want to do with the string, look it up first. See if there's an obvious way to do it. You can also Google, right, how to replace the first character in a string. And I, trust me, my job has been around for a long time. You will find answers. Um, and then use them in your program. Sometimes, you know, when, well, sometimes when we're working with strings, we have to do a couple of different things to the string, right? Uh, we might have to first divide it up in some way, and then we might have to first, you know, process the results or something like that. So, there, you know, string processing is a, is a really fun thing to be able to do, and it allows you to work with data that's text. And there's a lot of that out there in the world, right? So, you know, we looked a couple, we looked on Friday at the, the, those algorithm word counts, so how do, how, do we, how do we get those counts? How does Google know how often people have been using that word? Well, Google took a lot of text. Google basically created a huge amount of text data. Is, is anyone familiar with this project? So essentially, Google built this like really extremely effective digital scanner. And then they went to these libraries, and they started scanning books, 
What does that mean? It takes the contents of the book, which were previously just on paper. We're talking about older books. Now anything you buy, it's going to be available in the digital format, right? Now when writers start writing, I suspect a lot of them are using a word processor. So the words start out on a computer, right? And then they end up on paper because they got printed. But in the past, it was like words started off on paper and then somebody went to a, a typesmith who set them up on a printing press and they were always on paper. So there's all this data, particularly data that's really important to our species, that's locked away in that format. So again, you know, Google, if you look into the history of this project, there's some questionable things and some questionable decisions that Google made, but they essentially said, look, we'd like to make this data more available and we'd also like to make it more, more persistent, right? You know, data that's stored in libraries may seem safe, but libraries start on fire. You know, there have been, you know, famous times in human history where entire libraries have burned and destroyed huge amounts of knowledge that we will never get back. And so there's some case to be made for saying, hey, let's take this and move it into a digital format. That way, you know, if the Library of Congress burns to the ground or Harvard's library is burned to the ground or whatever, we'll still have it. We're not going to lose any, um, you know. Now, again, some of those artifacts are really irreplaceable, but at least we'll have the knowledge. So they converted all this paper data into text, into strings, into computer data. And then if you want to, like, let's say you want to count the number of times that algorithm was used in a particular year, you take all that text, you split it up into words, and then you write a for loop that goes through, I'm not kidding, right? That goes through all those words and says, is the word equal to algorithm? If it is, increase a counter. That's it, right? So this is an example of how, you know, this really interesting analysis is enabled by just transforming data from one format to another, taking it from paper and creating digital uh, representation. All right, any other questions about string? All right, so let's do a couple of problems together since we have some time to end the class, it's fun. So first um, problem, and this is a variant of a problem we were supposed to do last time and didn't get to, um, but now, Let's say the problem I want you to solve is I give you a string, and I want you to print off any time you see two of the same character in a row, right? So if this character is the same as the last character, I want you to print off that character. If not, I don't, right? All right, so how are we going to do this? Here's the question. All right, so what's my algorithm? Again, don't think about how to do this in Java. Just think about, like, if I gave you a string written down, thinking about how are you going to do it, describe to me, you know, the process that you would go through. Tell me your human algorithm, and then we'll figure out how to encode it as a Java program. Yeah. Okay, so I like that. It's a good starting point. So what is what is he doing? <coughs> Somebody put that a different way. Someone who hasn't spoken up yet. What am I doing to, in order to do this, right? I'm trying to use a suggestive hand gesture that apparently you guys have not learned how to interpret yet. Like if I give you a, I give you a word, and you're looking through, you're looking for duplicates, what are you doing? I told you to find any place where two consecutive characters are the same, yeah. Yeah, I'm looking at pairs of letters, right? And I'm, I'm basically, if the pair of letters, if the two letters in that pair are the same, then I found two consecutive characters that are the same. That's the definition, right? So I need to go through the string, and, and really, actually, I'm not going to go through the string character by character. I want to go pair by pair, right? So let's look at a string for an inspiration of how to do this, right? So the first two characters I want to look at are M and I. Are M and I the same? No. So now I look at the next pair. What's the next pair of characters? I and S. Are I and S the same? No. Next pair of characters. S and S. So I found a consecutive pair. So the first thing we're going to do is let's, let's think about how to write our loop. Because clearly I'm repeating a sequence of operations here, and I'm moving through the string. But let's figure out how to write our loop to uh, look at each pair of indices and then we'll figure out what to do with those things. So again, whenever you're, you're setting up something like this, I would do something like, 
loop over the entire string, okay? So now I'm gonna say, this is, this is my intention. This is what the piece of code I'm about to write is gonna try to do. So let's say for, I'm gonna use my standard for loop here. Now, input is a string, it's not an array, but I can still write a very similar for loop for working with string. Instead of using array.length, I use string.length open closed parenthesis method that I'm calling on. All right, so now let's print off the value of i. And again, this is our first step just to see if we're doing things right. Okay, so i goes from zero to 10. Mississippi has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 letters in it. So zero to 10 are the indices of Mississippi, okay? Of a, of a string of this size. But here I want to, here I said, I want to look at pairs, okay? So now what, let's, let's try this. So now let's print i, and then let's also print, I'll put this in parentheses, i plus one, okay? Oh, I need another plus, there we go. Sorry. All right. So now what I'm trying to do, and, and I'm close, but I'm not quite there, is I'm trying to look at all the pairs. So the first pair of characters in Mississippi is the character with index zero and the character with index one. So that's right, okay? And then I keep going, what's the problem here though? Okay, so eight and nine are valid, nine and 10 are valid. What happens when I get to the end? So is 10 a valid indice for the string? It is, Mississippi has 11 letters. So the valid indices are zero through 10. Is 11? No, 11 is one off the end. So if I want to print, and this is an interesting feature of any array. If an array has n elements, how many pairs of elements does it have? Consecutive pairs. n minus one. An array with two elements has one pair, an array with three has two pairs. And so instead of looping from all the way to the end of the string, I'm gonna stop one, one character early. So now let's look at the pairs of indices I have. Zero and one, one and two, those are all fine. I get to the end nine and 10. Nine is the second to last character and an 11 character string, 10 is the last character, so that's my last pair. Okay. So now my loop is correct. Um, so really what I did here is I'm gonna say loop over all pairs, all right? Now what I need to do is I need to figure out how to access that character in the string. Now. Unfortunately, now if you've worked in Python, you probably wanna do something like this, right? Or if you just feel like Java should be a nice language and help you out, why can't I just use the index like my string is an array and I can't because it doesn't do that, it doesn't work that way. So I can't access the character from a string using bracket notation. If this was an array, I could, the string, I can't. What can I do? just saw an example of this a minute ago when we looked at some of our more useful string functions. Again, someone who hasn't contributed yesterday. Just looked at an example of, there's a method that I can call that will allow me to retrieve a particular, yeah. Care at, yes, I always wanna say that caret, but it's care at, I think. All right, so now let's try this. Okay, look at that. I'm printing off the character, right? And you can see I'm printing off the first character in the pair, and so I don't see that last i, because I don't wanna go too far. So I stopped one character early. Now I'm really close. So now I know how to loop through all the pairs, and I know how to get a particular character from the string. What's the last thing I need to do here? Somebody help me out. I'm almost done. So now I have a way to get at all the data I need, yeah. Yeah, so I need an if statement inside my loop. I'm gonna say if the character at this position is equal to the character at the next position. Oh, gotta call the right function. If that's the case, I'm going to print the character at this And you know what, why not? Let's print the index too, just for fun. So I know where that character is, okay? 
There it is. So is it right? Let's check. Okay, so the characters it says are identical. And it, remember, I'm identifying pairs of characters. So the first pair of identical characters is at index two, and it starts with S. That's the first two S's in Mississippi. The second pair of characters that are equal starts at index five. That's the sixth character in Mississippi. That's also an S. This is two S's. And the last one's the two P's. Whenever we're testing something, let's test some, you know, what we call corner cases. So let's see if it will identify a pair at the end. It will. So it's not going to miss a pair very at the very end of the string. We'll identify a pair at the beginning. It will. So I can identify the pair at the beginning, I can identify a pair at the end, I find all the pairs in the middle. What if I have three characters in a row? Mississippi. There you go. Now, it treats that as two pairs, and that's correct. I told you to print off whenever there were two consecutive identical characters. Here, at position five, there are two characters in a row. That's an S and S. And position six, there are two characters in a row. That's also an S. So there are two pairs of consecutive characters. Any questions about that? Let's, yeah. Where, can I do one? So you want to print it here? So the question is, I, I think the question is, can I print both of the characters that were identical? Yeah, let's do this. My line got a little long there, but yeah. So now I'm printing the first character in the pair and the second character in the pair. And they're the same. That's why I entered this loop, the, the if statement. All right, let's do the following, since we have three minutes. Let's, re, let's, let's write this as a function. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take this little algorithm that we just wrote, and we're going to um, enclose it in a function so that I can use it in other places. So this function doesn't currently return a value. It just prints to the console. That's fine. I'm going to call this find identical characters. The empty, uh, its argument is a string. So it takes a string input. And then what I need to do, and please tell me that it's going to let me do this, is just move that all over to the right. There it is. OK? So now what's going to happen when I run this, I'm not going to see anything because I didn't call my function. Right? And let me call this something else. So now let's do find identical characters miss. Okay, that's great. Let's do find identical characters. Let's pass it a literal, like that also works. Right. So here's an example of applying sort of mixing concepts from strings, which we talked about today, functions, which we talked about Monday. So now I have a function called find identical characters. Um, why don't we do this? Let's change our function so that it returns the number of characters that are identical. So what do I need to do here? Somebody walk me through the steps. So instead of printing them, I want to return a count of how many pairs there are. Yeah. Yeah, so I need a counter variable in here. All right, let's call it int. I'm going to start it at zero because when I start my loop, I don't know how many characters are, but I can, my assumption is that there's zero until I find some. All right, so now what do I do? A couple of other steps, things I need to change here. Yeah, way in the back. Yeah, bingo. So instead of printing here, I'm going to add one to my counter. Okay, I'm so close. What do I need to do? I'm almost done. Yeah, over here. Yeah, then I need to actually return my counter when I'm done. Okay, almost there. Very close. And? Yeah, so now my function returns an in. Okay, so now, oh, and I need to print the result. So let's print the result of calling this. Hopefully the answer is four. There it is. Okay, good. This is where we're going to stop for today. I'm out of time. Um, announcement for today. So MP0 is out. People seem to be off to a great start. Hold on a sec. You guys are going to want to hear this. So, so Ben 
so getting Android Studio set up can be a little bit tricky, and some of you are encountering some strange problems. So Ben has volunteered to do office hours today ex just for people that are encountering weird problems with Android Studio. I'll post those on the calendar, and I'm going to confirm with him that he's going to be willing to do that. But if you're having problems with Android Studio, come talk to Ben. He is the wizard at this, right? He will fix it. Um, otherwise, I will see you guys on Friday. Uh, good luck. Come to office hours tomorrow if you need help on the MP.